Hello, everyone. My name is Austin Belzer, and I from Austin B Media, and I am going to be covering the Austin Film Festival. Insert your joke here. Um, and I have today Kirby McClure of the film Spaghetti Junction, and it's about about um, and forgive me if I get any of this wrong, uh, Kirby. Um, it's about well, I'll I'll let you introduce it. Sure. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, my film is called Spaghetti Junction. It's about a uh, disabled teenager in the Deep South who encounters a mysterious traveler one night. Um, and together they go on this kind of cosmic mission. Um, and I talk about it as, you know, it's romance and also healing because they both are in this sort of uh, situation where they need healing. And then there's also a romance that, you know, develops between them. Uh, but then also there's this kind of, uh, you know, dark force that's also sort of stalking them and they have this kind of conflict with at the end. Um, so, yeah, it's a, I guess it's a coming of age romance story, but with some psychological twists and things along the way. I like that the theme of pretty much every film I've uh, talked about um, regarding the Austin Film Festival has been, yes, this is a normal movie, but here's some weird stuff. <laughs> because I, I I love weird stuff. Um, like, if if I had a film drawn, it would just be named, here's some weird stuff. Um, like, stuff like Censor, Possessor, stuff like that is extremely just in my lane. Um, cool. Uh, but, so this is your directorial debut. Um, and I just, you, you get you're premiering this at the Austin Film Festival. Um, first of all, how does that feel? Um, because I don't think I, I, I don't get to talk to a lot of first time directors. I get to talk to a lot of short film directors who um, have maybe produced four or five short films. And then they're like, oh, this is like my premiere of this new short. Mm -hmm. But I don't really talk to people who just, up and do their own film uh, very often. Um, so how, do, how does that feel? Kind of walk me through that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been um, a journey for sure. Uh, it's been about, uh, well, we shot in the summer of 2019. Okay. But, you know, before that, there was the long process of uh, writing, obviously, and, and trying to find some resources and funds to actually make the film. Um, but I, I think probably the most difficult step or the, or the step that required the most time and sort of care and attention was, you know, finding the lead for the film, which is August. So that's played by Kate Hughes. Um, so she's an amputee. And for me, it was important that the role was played by an actual amputee who could bring that, you know, authenticity to the role. Um, so I think the casting process lasted close to a year, probably, um, before I found, you know, the the person that I knew could bring that magic and that authenticity uh, and that kind of introspection to the role that I was looking for and the way I had written that character. Uh, so I think, you know, through that entire process from the inspiration for the idea and the casting and the financing and assembling a crew and then shooting in the summer of 2019. And then also the entire post process was during the height of sort of, you know, the COVID pandemic and everything. So uh, my, my plan was to do all my post in London and then I was, um, you know, forced to do everything over Zoom. So it was me working very odd hours from uh, my house in Atlanta, uh, working, you know, on London time. So it had me up at like three o'clock in the morning sometimes and stuff. Uh, but, you know, I think uh, it was a long journey, but then, yeah, here we are. And then now it's premiering in what, five days, six days. So it's, uh, it does, it does feel really good. Yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty, I'm excited to get it out there. Of course, I'm nervous, you know, um, I've shown it to trusted people that, that I value their opinion. And um, I've gotten some really great feedback along the way that I think has made it a better film. Um, but this will be the first time that it's, you know, just let loose into the wild for people to see it and have feelings about it. And, and yeah, it'll be interesting. So I'm nervous, but, but of course, I'm, I'm very excited. Yeah, as kind of, I don't like this term, so apologies, but creator is kind of the label that gets put on me a lot it, because there's no other really word but like when I put out a big 
review, it's kind of like letting go of a baby. It's like, oh, I, you, you spent days maybe, well, it's longer with films. It's years, literally. Yeah. I mean, you just <laughs> talked about a year just casting um, Kate. Um, and, and it's like just this kind of sorrowful kind of thing because it's like, yeah. I, I don't get to work on this anymore. Uh, right. in, in kind of a weird way, I had this really weird experience reviewing uh, Bo Burnham's Inside um, because it's talking so much about that experience um, to a level where, you, like, I think only a few people can understand, like, right. that look he has at his laptop when he's <laughs> just going through the edits. And it's just like, I hate this. I hate looking at my face. I hate my voice. You know, I'm right. hearing myself talk and I'm like, ah, that's <laughs> what my voice sounds like. Ugh. Right. Um, but anyways, all yeah, that no, I, I know what you mean. That, that is interesting because it is, yeah, it's like a relationship that you're sort of yeah. um, ending and you're having to say goodbye to, or you're having to, you know, share that person. Um, yeah. And it, it's been my, my trusted friend to go to, you know, throughout, once again, like from before COVID, uh, up until now. So over the last two years of my life, it's been this ongoing process, you know, and, and because of the limited budget and stuff we had to work with, it was oftentimes having to work around other people's schedules and stuff. Um, but it was always this like special treat, you know, when I would get several days a week or whatever to kind of dial in with the colorist or the VFX artist and sound designers. And it was always this, yeah, um, escape almost into that world almost like the character herself going into these weird sort of dream worlds and stuff. I think for me, it was my um, escape into a dream world <laughs> too, you know, and, and now it's ending. So I don't know yeah, how to make just, a new one. You just kind of get into a flow where you're like, Oh, I've, I've done this. And then you're like, wait, I have to release it. Yeah. And then you're like, but I don't want to like, there's a right. review I'm holding on to right now. I'm like, I don't want to hit the <laughs> publish button because as soon as I hit that publish button, I mean, that doesn't, that means I don't have to work on it anymore. Or, and right. I don't want to stop working on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, getting back to the film itself, I, I was looking at this, and you described this movie as the Florida Project meets Under the Skin, two very different <laughs> films. Um, I, I feel like the Florida Project is all about this innocence of youth, and uh, Under the Skin is just not <laughs> that. So I... Right. So where do those influences kind of intersect, so to speak? Um, why, why those two films to describe the... Uh, yeah, I think, I think I mean that also in more of a um, t tonality, okay. I think as far as um, not necessarily story elements per se, but, but more of... Because um, the feedback I've gotten so far, and once again, it hasn't really premiered yet, so it's been a, a select few, but you know, um, the commentary has been either uh, wow, it's like, you know, you really, it's really intimate story and you really feel this girl's struggles with her family. And it's almost like this family drama, but then other people have commented like, wow, it, it has this really haunting sort of unsettling feeling the entire time. And I think, you know, in a really macro scale, that is to me, uh, the Florida project, which is whimsical and, and intimate and kind of warm, you know, and obviously there's yeah. struggles going on and stuff, but you feel their warmth and their uh, childlike perspective of these sort of um, bigger issues they're having to deal with is, is very young people. But then under the skin is this, uh, you know, uh, yeah, haunting, heavy, creepy, sort of ominous kind of feel. Um, and I think in a way, tonally, um, I was going for that very much where it is this girl in the deep south in this sort of colorful, vibrant world around her with this family. But yet there is this weird hum of like, trucks and droning industrial equipment that's always in the distance and dogs barking and this just um the feeling that something's not right in her world and, and i think for her age too you know like as a she i think her role is sort of like she's 16 um and also she's had this sort of catastrophic you know injury that she's dealing with so it's like a the summertime and everything should be happy and she's looking at her sister and the people around her but then everything has this sort of darkness that's like coming this like impending doom or something you know but um yeah yeah it's funny you mentioned the impending doom like the <laughs> phrase i most try and avoid in in all my horror movie reviews is like sometimes character uh a camera is being used as the character like where it embodies like 
somebody looking on or something like that. And um, the phrase is that uh, creature around the corner uh, mm -hmm. is that phrase where I'm like, ah, that's it. But I don't want to say that again. Uh, but yeah, but, but yeah, I just it, it is very interesting because um, that, that that is a very diametrically opposed kind of tone. It's this, and, and I guess going to Kate. Um, so this is about um, uh, an amputee, and you, you, Kate is herself, I believe, an amputee. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, how, how, how did, how, I guess my question is how, how did you go about creating this environment for her where she can kind of give you feedback about her experiences as a, a amputee and for that to also inform the character of um, I, I believe it's Amber is her is the name of uh, August her? August sorry yeah um, yeah no that's that's a great question because um, that's where a lot of the the process of of our collaboration came in is her sort of feeding back on the script. But of course, you know, before the script even came to her, obviously the writing process for me was, you know, quite heavily reliant on researching um, what it's like to be an amputee and especially a teenage amputee. Um, and I contacted, you know, quite a few uh, like prosthetic clinics and amputee camps and lots of places where I was able to get information of, of what it's like and they would refer me to certain people um, to chat with and sort of get feedback. But then, so I crafted this, you know, script, but then when I found Kate, then it was her time to kind of feedback on what I had crafted and sort of breathe her life into it. And the, the authenticity I think came from, from her in these little moments. Um, like for instance, there's stuff in the, the scenes in the film where, um, you know, she wakes up in the middle of the night startled when she hears a sound and she goes to get out of bed and she just falls flat. Yeah. And apparently that's, that's a pretty common, Thing that happens, especially to recent amputees, because they're, you know, they spend a good chunk of their life with two legs, and then you go to stand on, or in the shower, for instance. Apparently, people relax in the shower and they just lose their balance. Um, so that's the pretty common thing that there was a reoccurring thing that I got when I was contacting people and looking for answers of what it's like to be a recent amputee. So I knew that was the kind of thing that was important to to put into the story to make it, you know, real for what it would be like, um, and then. Yeah, lots, lots of little details too um, that she was able to bring beyond that. Um, but the, the thing about Kate is she actually, she was an amputee when she was 11 months old because she was born with a, a clubbed foot. So she had a you know, deformity that had her amputated quite young. But um, you know, for the character of August is someone who was a more recent amputee. So basically, so Kate lives in, in Queens in New York and for her to kind of, I, want, I needed her to become the character that lives here, which is in a place called Spaghetti Junction, which is right outside of Atlanta. And Doraville is the name of the town. And, um, you know, I needed her to adapt to not only being a recent amputee, but also being someone not from New York and someone who lives here in this sort of post-industrial New South kind of world, where it's not the old South of, you know, idealism and stuff. It's, it's more of a uh, industrial kind of uh, lots of freeways twisting and turning and um, people from all over the world now. And it's sort of, you know, a, a strange mesh of things going on. So I brought her down, her and her mom, because she was 17 at the time, maybe six, 16. And so her and her mom came down for the summer and she walked almost exclusively with the uh, hand crutch that someone who would have been a more recent amputee, even though she doesn't need a crutch anymore. She has a quite sophisticated uh, prosthetic limb, uh, but she walked with a crutch again and with a more um, you know, uh, the type of prosthetic leg that someone who wasn't more of a recent amputee would have as well. So she walked like that for a month just to kind of get back into character of what it would be like to be reliant on a crutch and to live here and, and shop at the grocery stores and go to school here and have a dad who works here and living in that house. So I actually rented the house that we shot in and she lived there with her mom for like a month just to kind of become that character, you know. Um, so yeah, all those things kind of yeah, fed into her character. That's an insane level of detail I didn't even think about. Um, because I, I'm a recent, what do you call it? Um, I, I guess transplant, for lack of a better term, of 
from the Midwest to the South. Um, mm -hmm. And I can, I can only imagine what that'd be for, for a disabled teenager. Um, I don't live yeah. in the Georgia area, but um, there are areas of where I live where it's like, I don't see how someone who is disabled could go through that because there's just certain inaccessibility to it. Um, or even living yeah. in a city, if we're going to be honest. Um, of course, yeah. But that it... Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's the thing too about cities though, at least is there are, everything's walkable because it's more you know compacted of a city. So there's a walkability to it here. It's, and there's scenes of her, you know, walking across like big freeway overpasses and stuff and like busy roads and these kind of things. Cause that's the only way you can kind of get around if you're not driving, especially which, you know, someone older would be doing. Um, so she's catching rides with people with these kind of uncomfortable situations with this guy in a souped up car who's like blasting drum and bass music, you know, that she's kind of cramped into the back or she's having to walk with a crutch, you know, very vulnerable across these big twisting freeways with trucks passing and stuff. Uh, it's definitely not um, a safe or comfortable place even for someone who's not disabled in any way, you know, but then yes. that extra vulnerability, I think, um, yeah, it affects people for sure. Yeah, and, you know, um, going a little bit back um, to talent, um, you've got an insanely talented crew here. I mean, just looking at it, you've got health from the Grand Theft Auto games, um, which, first of all, how? How did you get that guy? And then, like, what's it like working with somebody who's worked on like these big projects like that. I mean, yeah. you open up Apple Music or Spotify or whatever, uh, and that Grand Theft Auto V soundtrack is like hours long. Anyways, yeah. to put it shortly, like what is it like to work with people who have maybe done a, a, a few more things like I know there's a member of the movie Pearl Harbor on here um right mm -hmm. and did, did you like learn anything from them or um did, did you teach them something I mean I think we're, yeah we're all feeding off of each other for sure um with health they uh they're a band who um started around the same time that I moved to LA back in like 2006 uh there was a place called The Smell and all of these kind of amazing noise rock uh, and kind of weird, super cool bands would play. And um, I got turned on to health by just going there one night. Um, and they became these sort of, you know, legends, I think, in like the underground sort of noise scene in LA at that time. Um, and now they tour with Nine Inch Nails and they're sort of, you know, very, very big. But yeah, they've been invited to, uh, yeah, Max Payne and Grand Theft Auto. And they've gone on to do some really incredible stuff. I had worked together. So I met them when we were all sort of young um, growing up in LA area. I didn't grow up there, but moving there when I was young. Um, uh, so we, we knew of each other and then through music videos that I did for bands that they're friends with as well. Um, and then they scored a, a, um, a performance piece that I did um, for Fashion Week a few years back. Um, it was like this holographic kind of ballet. Um, and, you know, we had, a, it was sponsored by Lexus. So we had like a, a decent amount of budget to work with. So them being kind of my old uh, friends or people that I always admired, at least from a distance, they were my first people to go to and say like, look, now we've actually got money, you know, let, let's yeah. create something strange and beautiful that we can just kind of let loose. Um, so they created something incredible for this performance um, that my partner and I directed uh, a few years back. So they were always sort of on my list of when I get to make my first film, who I'm going to, to work with. Um, so I think, you know, for the film, once I had a rough cut, I sent it to them and, you know, along with some references of different music that I was using as sort of temp music and that kind of thing. And I fed them lots of references and they came back. I mean, I was really interested in like shoegaze kind of music, like, you know, My Bloody Valentine or Slow Dive, that kind of thing. Um, Drony, atmospheric and kind of romantic. Um, and then I fed them like horror soundtrack stuff, like the Dawn of the Dead soundtrack. Um, and then, you know, what they came back with was none of those things, but, but it had 
it was just health, you know, like they, they, they took my references in their own completely unexpected direction. And what they came back with was not what I expected, but it was awesome, you know, and it was incredible to me. And then certain scenes that before their score were sort of um, interesting, but, you know, they didn't have like the depth to them once I was to lay their score and suddenly it was like powerful, you know, um, thanks to them and, and what they brought to it. So, yeah, I yeah. think, I think score is a very important part of a movie, um, no matter how long. Um, because, like, imagine a horror like Halloween without that music. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Like, right. if it was just like you filled it with temp music. Like, imagine being <laughs> in the editing bay and all you heard was like leaf crunch, leaf crunch, right. leaf crunch. Yeah, yeah. Like, it, it's a very interesting thing of how score um, drives the viewers experience because i mean for sure like just being in the uh watching no time to die uh in the in a imax theater that's a very right. visceral experience and yeah. um i know it's just this huge thing but like imagine going into a james bond movie with like the without the donna donna of course yeah uh, you know yeah, it's iconic absolutely yeah. um Anywho, I, I think that's a very interesting thing because, you know, I, I don't know why this calls to mind, um, but I, when the Tenet Blu-ray came out, the Christopher Nolan movie, um, mm -hmm. he was talking about how he had uh, Ludwig Granson on set just, like, off to the side. He, he's like, hey, I shot this. Look at it. And... Show, show me what you think. And then he's just like making temp tracks in like the closet somewhere. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I love that. But, but yeah, I mean, and also the telehealth, if they make a Grand Theft Auto 6, I, just <laughs> let me, let, let me hear some of it. No. Um, <laughs> I think, but, I, I love that approach though, what you're saying, because I mean, for me, sound is, you know, more than 50% of the experience, you know, like yeah. people say it's like, oh, it's visual and music or visual and sound. But for me, I, I feel like I almost shoot a scene and I have the sound in mind. You know, it's like I, it's almost like I shoot stuff just to put sound to because sound to me like the and in my film, you know, beyond the, the music, there is this constant hum of trucks and stuff in the, in the distance because Spaghetti Junction, which is this like eight twisting freeways coming together. You hear it all night, motorcycles, trucks, you know, the brakes of these big semi trucks, which is this sort of like staccato kind of do, 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 do sound that's just this driving and vibrating the ground. Um, and it's almost like, you know, when I would shoot a scene of a dad and his daughter, you know, eating a grilled cheese sandwich together, which is, you know, can be mundane or whatever. But then when you put the sound of trucks in the distance, it just, you sort of remember that it's like a dad and a daughter eating a sandwich with this ominous thing happening around them. And they're on a rock floating in outer space. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. this bigger sort of thing happening around people at a dining table eating a sandwich, you know? Um, so yeah, that was a big part of, I think the way I approached the scenes was knowing that that level of ambience would hopefully um, add something unspoken and atmospheric to the human experience or whatever. Yeah. yeah and it's kind of funny. You mentioned that hum is like, I used to, for a year I lived in uh, Kansas city, uh, the only true one in Missouri. Um, Kansas city, Kansas does not exist. That's right, yeah. Kansas City, Missouri was first. Um, so I've heard, yeah. Yeah, like, I, I, my mom was showing me something about, like, this person was on TikTok and saying they went to this Kansas City restaurant, and I'm like, oh, yeah, where, where was it? And I look it up, and it's Kansas City, Kansas, and I'm like, you didn't go to I, Kansas City. Yeah, you you didn't bad. go to Union Station. You didn't. <laughs> Anyways, but, like, I had a, an apartment seven floors up, um, and it was right by a park. So you'd hear all these, you'd go to sleep, well, I'd go to sleep, um, and you'd hear all these cars running by, and going back to sound, it's just this, I had to turn on Alien to fall asleep. Right. Not yeah. that Alien is boring, but yeah. like, just that Anything loud, but... like, Dum. Yeah, yeah. Because it was drowning out the, just, well, Right. Meow. Yeah. And the screeching brakes and all that. Um, but so, yeah, that's kind of interesting how you talk about sound. It pulls you into this location, this space. Um, 
sometimes yeah. literally in this uh, <laughs> film. Right. Um, <laughs> but uh, get, I, I guess getting to that, you, you think about this movie, you think Spaghetti Junction. Now, if you just look at the name, you're thinking, oh, this is like a Western movie. Mm. Because mm. You, th you associate spaghetti with Spaghetti Western. Spaghetti Western, right, right, yeah. Um, but the uh, uh, Tylee, Tyler Rainey's character is just mm -hmm. a supernatural uh, character. And just how, how did that supernatural bit come about? Because it doesn't seem like otherwise those Lego pieces, uh, to put a metaphor in place, mm -hmm. uh, would fit together. Yeah. I think for me, it was, it was important to, you know, when you explore the life of a, a teenager who just lost a leg in a car crash and what she's going through in her life. And, you know, to me, you can't fully tell that story without going into what's happening inside of her head. So it's not just what you're seeing on the surface of how she's dealing with people. It's like, what are her dreams? What are her fantasies? What is she thinking about? It's, um, you know, affecting the, the waking life is what's going on inside of her. Um, so she's at this age as a 16 year old where she's starting to have, you know, romantic interests and that kind of thing. And she looks at her sister as a reference, who's a bit older than her, who has this boyfriend who's very aggressive and sort of like um, cliche, kind of like sexy, cool dude or whatever. Um, and I think she's looking at him and thinking like, you know, is that who I'm supposed to be into like a guy like that like i don't like that person that person's not you know uh what i'm looking for so um and i think she's turned off in general by like what the idea that's being fed to her from her surroundings of what a romantic relationship is so then she starts to mix these things in in her dreams when she sees this you know shooting star one night in the sky and looking for escape from this world and from what's being pressed upon her of what she needs to be going after romantically and that kind of thing where it all just starts to blend together in her dreams, where the shooting star, maybe some kind of visitor has come to our planet. And, you know, in her dreams, he's sort of like summoning her. And then she looks down and sees in the dream that she has two legs again. So it's like something about this experience is making her feel complete again for the first time. Um, so that sort of bleeds together with something that's also happening in their small town, which is this kid who's gone missing. So there's news reports of in the newspapers of, of this kid who has gone missing and no one knows what's happened to him. And everyone's kind of speculating of, you know, could, could, was he kidnapped? Is he a runaway? What, where did this guy go? Um, so it's almost like that bled into her subconscious to be like, I wish I could disappear like that guy, you know? Um, and then he yeah. meets her in the dream and then they, that's how it kind of happens, I think. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting answer because when you were saying that, my, have, have you ever read the book Ender's Game? Mm -mm. No, I haven't, but I know about it. Yeah. It, it, that what you were describing kind of um, brought about in my mind my experience while reading it, it is because Ender is a boy who, you know, he doesn't have any physical deformities or anything like that, um, but he, his brother bullies him. He beats him, mm. um, and he joins this academy because he just he wants to prove his brother wrong. He's like, no, I am strong. I'm stronger than you, and I you don't need to bully me anymore because I'm stronger than you. Right. Um, but then it, um, well, I won't spoil the twist. <laughs> um, yeah. But I was just thinking about that, and you know, I, I gotta be honest that actually. Mm -hmm. It, it just it intrigues me more just what you just said right there um even though i'm i'm definitely gonna be watching this um probably as tonight um yeah. and it's just like I, I i'm starting to understand that under the skin vibe more because it just makes sense if that for better or worse it it it's trying to place tragedy in the place of pain or right. tr trying to make sense out of pain. Yeah, um, no, no, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, and that's just, go, go ahead. Yeah, no, sorry. I, th I think, um, yeah. And the, throughout the film, the things as the film sort of 
spirals into this more and more kind of surrealistic, weird story. Um, it's almost like everything that happens to her are these weird symbols of stuff that she's fighting in her head. Like, you know, is this battle that she sort of has in the end, is that real? Or was that something in her imagination? Is she triumphing over something in her head? that's like an insecurity, you know, uh, or some kind of self-confidence or, or pain, something that's holding her back because she feels inferior at this time in her life because she's trying to cope with this new injury. But, you know, hopefully by the end, it feels like she's, regained some kind of confidence or she has a new confidence you know out, out of the destruction of her body she sort of uh finds a new confidence um by finding a new self you know but um yeah i think there's a lot of that kind of thing it's like it's like finding fantasy and escape to deal with psychological problems and yeah. and then in the end she sort of uh wins and, and and her life goes back to normal in the end basically um, and once again, I don't want to spoil it for you, actually, but if yeah. you haven't seen the, the full thing, but um, I just ran I think, out of time before. This. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, uh, it's just the in the end, you know, some 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 of the feedback I've got from some people is like, wow, you know, I, I enjoyed the journey of your film, but in the end, I almost wanted her to like go with him into his world, um, and instead he he, you know, he leaves. But I think. Um, people wanted her to leave her world and go with him and escape forever. But to me, it was important that she doesn't escape her problems. And instead she learned from this experience she had with this supernatural, you know, uh, entity. And then she returns back to her life with her dad and with her little world. But I think she's changed forever, you know, because of what happened to her. So even though she didn't go off into some strange, mysterious world, she comes back to her world with a new perspective, hopefully that's, healthier maybe or you know something yeah i think that's kind of why um not to compare it to another film but i think that's why the ending of sound of metal works um, right. as well as it does because uh, i guess spoilers for sound of metal um on this <laughs> interview but yeah. um it, it it you don't want to know that the characters are all right you just want to know have they dealt with this right um at, at least that's how i put it but yeah i think that's great I, I i think you have done a great job selling people who haven't even heard of this movie um <laughs> on this movie like i mm -hmm. i think if i was had i not read anything about that that would be the selling point it's like oh yeah this is just so much deeper than any person can understand um, it's just got so many layers to it um, that I think people will be unraveling on rewatches. Um, and who knows? Um, but I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the dream. You know, I, I, yeah. I, I hope people respond to it. And I hope that, um, yeah, some of those layers are revealed. I mean, yeah, of course. That's the dream. If people watch it more than once, that would be ideal. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I hope, I hope, uh, it'll be interesting to see, you know, Saturday night, that's when um, the curtains unveiled and people see my film for the first time. So. Yeah, it uh, screens Saturday, October 23rd at the Galaxy Highland 5 and on Eventive, uh, courtesy of the Austin Film Festival. And I believe, um, for those who aren't attending physically um, at, or just want to check this film out, I believe, if I remember Eventive right, um, it goes for the unlock is for the whole festival, um, as long as you hit the purchase button, of course. Um, and as long as you don't hit play, that thing is good for the rest of the Austin Film Festival, which is the 21st through the 28th. Um, and when, once you hit play, that's I think 40 hours, and then it'll expire, which I think is really generous. Uh, yeah, because cool. Sundance was only like 24 hours, maybe. And I was like, but I want to see Passing again. No, <laughs> no. Um, actually, I'm going to see Passing again here soon, about a month, because that nice. comes out on Netflix. Right, um, right. But uh, Kirby, I want to thank you so much for joining me. It, it, yeah. it truly has been a pleasure. Um, I always like talking to directors, and I think I... I, I probably should go back and look at my other interviews, but I think this is the first time I've talked to a director uh, who has done their first 
I believe, I believe first film. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, so I just want to appreciate, I appreciate all the insight you've given me, uh, yeah. to watchers, listeners, what, what have you. Um, of course. Because, Thank, thanks for the great questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, because I think I, I've said this on, on pretty much every interview in the past month, but um, I think the more we start to understand how films are made the, and get insight from filmmakers, it becomes less of a, oh, this is just another movie in a crowd, and this is more of a, oh, hey, if you check out X movie. If you check out this movie that's really weird, just check it out. Right. You know, because in a world where we're just hitting stream now or yeah, yeah. Um, on our phones or, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, rant over, but thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Take and, care. And again, uh, people can ch check this out at the Austin Film Festival, physically at the Galaxy Highland 5 in Austin, Texas um, on October 23rd and on Aventive from October 21st to the 28th. I believe That's right. and badges yeah. are pretty cheap so yeah it, so pretty much anyone get a, get get on this even if you're not planning on attending the whole festival true true sounds good yeah but right. thank you so much yeah absolutely thank you take care take care nice to meet you good chatting with you yeah good chatting with you too take care take care mm -hmm.